you, Tony and friends. It's great to be with you. I should have said too that for a little while I was a school teacher. Uh, when I finished my uni course, I taught for a few years at Westall Secondary College, which was a fantastic experience because 85% of the people who were students there were actually from overseas. So it was a great experience, and one of my one of the things that I'm really glad about Sindel is that we are a very multicultural church. We have uh, people, some years ago, we had people from over 50 different countries, and it might be more now, but we have uh, three ethnic congregations as well as three English congregations, so it's been a real privilege to be part of that scene. But it's, it's a delight to be here this weekend with you, and someone was telling me over dinner that they normally go to bed at 8 o'clock, so I just need to say that if you need to sleep, uh, then feel free. Uh, I'll, I'll think you're just meditating. But uh, looking forward to a great time together over these days. We're in the middle of some really interesting times, aren't we? Floods, elections, wars, traditional values being questioned, COVID or flu, consequences. It's a season with heaps of challenges and more than a few opportunities and it's a season and a time when crucial questions are also being asked and inquiry is unfolding and we're waiting on political leaders and health leaders for wise and encouraging words but it's also a great time for the Church of Jesus Christ. This season has seen more Australians exploring faith questions and seeking some wise words and guidance about handling difficult seasons. In fact, an email came through late this afternoon, about 4.30 from the National Church Life Survey, identifying a range of questions that people have been asking in these days. Leaders have been exploring how to prepare well and lead well through such seasons as this and how to recuperate after intense times. I don't know about you, but there has been just a weariness in the lives of many people over these last few years. And it's not just long COVID, it's the changes that we've been through. Some people are asking, where is God at times like this? Is Jesus a bystander when life throws up challenges? Or could he be a game changer? What do you reckon? One of the most crucial questions that was ever asked by Jesus to his disciples was, who do you say that I am? It was a bit like saying, so what's the latest, guys? What are people saying? Some are saying Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And then he challenged these followers to say, who do you say that I am? Peter gave a great answer. You read about it in, in the different Gospels. He said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. You're the Messiah. It was a bit like Jesus said, you nailed it. You got it right. But then Peter didn't fully understand because Jesus went on to explain what being the Messiah was all about. And Peter took him aside and said, I think you got it wrong. And Jesus' rebuke was pretty challenging. In our series over these uh, few days, we're going to look at a number of stories, mainly from Luke, some of which are found in other Gospels. But Luke, like all of the Gospels, is about Jesus of Nazareth, real, flesh and blood human, whose personal story is also God's story about his initiative to put things right in his world. And it's a story of confrontation between the familiar empires of the world and God's kingdom. God's kingdom built on a new model of lordship and leadership. And Jesus from time to time would challenge those who were following him what's involved in the sort of leadership that he's initiating. It's a story of revolution, of healing and feasting rather than violence. And ever since Jesus had arrived on earth, opinions about Jesus had been divided and they have been ever since. At times, his family thought he was insane and an embarrassment to them. The religious leaders saw him as a threat and thought he was possessed by a demon. 
evil spirits kept shouting out that he was the son of God and wanted him to leave them alone. In contrast, hundreds and hundreds of people flocked to see him, to hear him and to seek help from him. They couldn't get enough of him. Today, whether we follow Jesus all our lives or whether we know very little about him, our answer to Jesus' question, who do you say I am, will have a huge impact both on our present and our future and also on our past. In normal day-to-day -day life, whatever that is now, there are some who get involved in crisis and challenge and it's been wonderful see, to see the way that even over recent days with the floods, the practical and financial support for those impacted has been amazing. However, it's also true that there are many who don't get involved. Now, it's probably right that most of us would like to think that if there was something going on that wasn't right, we would nobly stand up and halt harm and change things. However, research shows that most people tend to struggle with the decision to get involved. People get caught up in an internal debate over whether helping out is their responsibility or is it the responsibility of someone else. Others worry about misjudging an unclear situation and con consequently embarrassing themselves. And another major obstacle to intervention is a phenomenon called diffusion of responsibility. In other words, if several people are witnessing a questionable situation, all individuals present are much less likely to step up and help out because each thinks someone else from the group will do that. And in still other cases, the person witnessing the situation believes the victim is in some way responsible for the situation and is now receiving what should have been expected. So, the probing question Jesus po posed to his disciples, who do you say I am, is the one that we're going to look at. And today we're going to take a look and immerse ourselves for a few minutes in three stories that could help us answer that question. You can read the stories in Matthew 8 and 9, Mark 5 and Luke 8. And maybe a little differently tonight, I'm going to share these stories in the first person as though I'm there. Story number one. Life had been hell for me. Somehow my life had been overtaken by forces that pressured me to do incredibly weird and socially unacceptable things, include going around naked. There was the smell of death about my life. In fact, I lived in a graveyard. People didn't understand me. They wanted nothing to do with me and longed for me to be out of the picture. On occasions, to try and deal with me, they treated me like a captured animal and bound me with chains, hand and foot. But the forces in me gave me superhuman strength and I would break the shackles. To get relief, I would try and cut myself with stones. People were scared of me and would avoid me at all costs. They thought I was mad and dangerous and I probably was. One afternoon, a guy arrived by boat from the other side of the lake. The forces inside me were on high alert. I could sense there was a showdown brewing. It was like I was thrust towards this guy, whom I now know was Jesus. In fact, that's what came out of my mouth as I ran towards him. The voices from inside prompted me to yell, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torture me. You see, already Jesus had spoken and commanded the evil spirits within me to come out. How much of my torment was real or imaginary didn't matter. What mattered is that I needed deliverance. Jesus didn't avoid me or turn away or ignore me. Rather, he weighed right in 
and his authority took over. The demonic forces inside me had to do what he said. And although I don't understand it, somehow he set me free and those demons left me and caused about 2,000 pigs to stampede down into the lake and drown. But I was free, free at last. My disordered mind and my tormented body were at peace. The whole episode caused an uproar among the pig herders. Word spread and soon people arrived and couldn't believe that I was relaxed rather than agitated, sitting rather than running around, clothed rather than naked, interacting well with people rather than scaring them. I was at peace. They didn't understand and felt anxious and afraid. Their routine and comfort had been disturbed so they pleaded with Jesus to get out of the area. I wanted to go with him, but he said no. He told me instead to go home and share the story of what Jesus had done in my life. I would have loved to have gone with him, but I obeyed. And what followed was quite remarkable. I got to share the story of how Jesus changed the game for me in a big way. I got to share it with people in 10 towns, 10 very specially connected towns whose population was predominantly Greek and with heaps of Greek gods. I became a living, walking, breathing, unmistakable, unanswerable demonstration of what Jesus can do in a person's life. I wasn't a basket case. I became the first witness to a Gentile world of what Jesus can do. I'm so thankful that Jesus didn't give up or walk away or watch from a distance or warn people not to come near me. He changed my game. His words to me were life transforming. Story number two. And a third story will be inserted in the middle of this one. My name is Jairus, and I've been the leader of the Jewish church for years, the administrative head, the president of the board of elders who ensured the good management of things in the synagogue. My girl, she's 12, and just on the threshold of womanhood, but still my little girl. She was really sick, dying. I was desperate. Jesus and I hadn't really been on the same page. In fact, I didn't, have what, I didn't want much to do with him. He was a heretic, I thought. And others, along with others from the synagogue, I saw him as disruptive and a rule breaker. And yet there was something really authentic about him. The way he cared, the way he spoke, the way he taught, and the way he lived. You couldn't help but be curious. When my girl, my little girl was so sick, I realised that desperate people do desperate things. And despite what others might think, despite my prejudices, my pride and dignity, I went to find Jesus. There was a huge crowd around him, but I pushed through the crowd. People were surprised, but I didn't care. I needed help and I threw myself at Jesus' feet and begged for him to come and help my little girl. He agreed and we headed off together. Others followed. He didn't seem in a hurry, but walking with him I felt encouraged and strangely hopeful. Then all of a sudden he stopped and looked around. He asked the crowd, who touched me? I thought to myself, are you kidding? There's a crowd of people. In fact, Jesus' followers said out loud what I was thinking. Jesus waited. And I waited. He looked around to see who would own up. I couldn't believe what happened next. 
I saw a woman coming forward. I knew this woman. She'd been excluded from temple worship because of her physical condition. I felt for her, but I didn't know what to do to help. Poor lady, she'd been hemorrhaging for 12 years. People knew that she'd tried a range of remedies and spent her savings on doctors, but no one could help. She kept getting worse. She wasn't dead, but she might have wished she was. I'll let the lady tell her story. Story number three. And then I'll finish story number two. Story number three. The bleeding wouldn't stop. It was so embarrassing. I couldn't go out without wondering whether I would flood. I was also always so tired and drained of energy. People got to know and would avoid me and I knew that sometimes I smelt. I wanted help. And I tried to get it, but nothing worked long term. I believed in God and wondered why this was happening to me. My condition meant that I was not able to go to the temple and I didn't even want to go to the synagogue. I knew the Jewish laws saw me as unclean. I felt like an outcast and a basket case. I'd heard about Jesus and desperate people do desperate things. I hoped no one would notice as I pressed through the crowd because to touch people would mean that they would also be unclean. I just wanted to touch Jesus' clothes as my heart cried out for his help. When I touched his clothes, something changed within me and immediately I knew the bleeding had stopped. But then I froze because Jesus stopped and he turned around and he asked who touched me when with trepidation I finally acknowledged that it was me he spoke so beautifully and caringly I told him the whole truth it was such an encouragement to hear him affirm the tiny seed of faith that I had and that that had been helpful in having the game changed for me forever. It's Jairus back again. I was gobsmacked with what had just happened for this lady, only to be greeted with the news that in the meantime, my daughter, my little girl, had died. I was urged not to trouble Jesus anymore. He overheard what was being said and he interjected with, Don't be afraid, Jairus. Trust me. Keep on believing in me. Could I? I wanted to. And especially after what I'd just witnessed. At this point, he stopped the crowd following and proceeded with me and three of his followers. And when we got home, we were met with a whole lot of crying and wailing and flute playing. Being able to give full vent to sadness and grief is really healthy. And those who had gathered were already right into it. To hear this and to know that my girl had died was heartbreaking. But somehow, I just kept hoping and trusting as Jesus declared that my daughter was sleeping and not gone forever. <laughs> my relatives and the mourners laughed at him when he said that. He was not deterred. With tenderness and with an authority that was unmistakable, he asked everyone to leave except me and my wife and the disciples. We went into the room where my girl was lying. Jesus reached down, took her by the hand and said, Little girl, come, get up. He helped her to her feet and she began to walk. We were stunned and overjoyed. We hugged our little girl. We hugged a long time until Jesus broke in and said, find her something to eat. She'll be hungry. He also added, don't tell anyone about this. It's a strange thing, isn't it, for Jesus to say? 
You know, Jesus could have wiped me. He could have stood back and said, bad luck, mate. You kicked me out of the synagogue. Why should I help you? But instead, he changed my game. He drew faith out of me. He helped me see things from his perspective and draw on his resources and live into his purpose. As I reflected later, I couldn't help but wonder at the despair and the distress of the mourners and the serenity and the hopefulness of Jesus. I also didn't initially understand why Jesus would not want us to broadcast what had happened. But I think it was because people would misunderstand the nature of his kingdom. Was? Is Jesus simply a good guy? Or God? A boundary breaker? Or a rule maker? A storyteller? Or a life shaper? Or both? A bystander? Or a game changer? He's no bystander. He chose to immerse himself in the lives of human beings. He came to live among people. He came to apply the resources of heaven to the needs of people. His welcome to people, his acceptance and love for people disarmed them, roused their curiosity, sparked their hope and drew out faith. Every page of every gospel has stories of Jesus being a game changer in the lives of people and families. In sport, a game changing moment is when something extra special happens. When something out of the box is done and it sends the game in a different direction. That's what Jesus has done and he can do in the lives of people, whatever their situation. And when Jesus changes the game, he's committed, it, he's committed to it being not just for a moment or an hour or a day. He wants it to be a lifelong, fruitful, growing experience in relationship with him. You know, these stories leave me with a few questions. For example, we only have details of Jesus raising three people who had only recently died. Why not more? I asked myself that question about my own wife, Jenny, died at 53. Hundreds, thousands of people were praying for her. How do you make sense of that? I don't have time today to tell you about the range of things that happened because God's grace was sufficient in the midst of all of that. That opened doors and opportunities that we would never have had otherwise. Still sucks that she had to go through it. But God worked in amazing ways. Well, what about people who weren't or aren't cured? N.T. Wright in his commentary on Mark says this. Jesus didn't come as a one-man liberation movement or a lone ranger medical centre. These amazing things were signs of a revolution, of a real and lifelong healing that Jesus would accomplish through his death and resurrection. Signs of forgiveness and hope that can be experienced by every person. Behind the intense dramas of each story lies a bigger picture of Jesus on his way to confront evil at its very heart. He will confront death itself and defeat it in a way as surprising as these three stories. So it poses for me the question, so what are the ingredients for game changing in a person's life or a family's life or a church's life? I reckon they include four things. An encounter with Jesus. And you know, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday today and forever. So that's the first ingredient. The second is a vulnerability to acknowledge a need and seek help. A willingness to say, I've got a need. Can you help? And you know, one of the things that ought to be true of every church is that it ought to be a place where people can acknowledge they have a need and seek help. You know, it's been said over the years that the church has shot its wounded. But I'm challenged by what I read in Acts. 
where it says that anyone who had a need in Acts 2 and Acts 4, anyone who had a need had that need met. How did that happen? I wonder whether it happened because people lived close enough to each other in community that they sensed when there was a need and offered to help. Or the church was such a safe place for people to acknowledge, I've got a need, can you help me? But sometimes in church, we're, we're supposed to put on a brave face, aren't we? And not acknowledge that we've got a need. So an ingredient for a life-changing moment is not only that Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever, we need an encounter with Jesus, but there has to be a vulnerability to acknowledge need and seek help. And then there has to be some faith in Jesus, even a tiny bit of faith. And I love these stories where it seems that Jesus draws out that tiny seed. It's not how much faith we have, but it's the person in whom we have faith. And there's even that story of the four guys who brought their mate to Jesus. And the scripture says that when Jesus saw their faith, it's pretty encouraging. And then there needs to be an ongoing daily walking with Jesus, listening to him for the wise word for your situation, learning from him and working with him. You know, scripture tells us whenever Jesus was at home, there was power to bring wholeness. When Jesus is at home in a person's life, there's power to do amazing things. Whatever your situation or your story today or those whom you'll encounter every day, Jesus came to earth to be God with us. That's an amazing statement, isn't it? Emmanuel, God with us. He came to extend forgiveness and offer hope, to speak wisdom into every situation. I wonder whether today there's something that might be stopping you drawing on his resources and seeking his help for there to be an ongoing game changing in your life or mine. And then a challenge that in the streets where you live, in fact I don't only live at 49 Josephine Avenue, Mount Waverley because that's a geographical location. There's a bunch of people in the streets around us who don't yet know Jesus. Some of them do, some of them have come to be part of our church community, but there's a whole bunch that don't. And I reckon I'm located there because Jesus wants me to be a representative of his in the lives of those people. And we can talk more about how that might happen. But today, this is a great opportunity for us as followers of Jesus, empowered by the Spirit of God to represent Jesus in our neighbourhoods, our shopping centres, our sporting clubs, our school or university campuses, our work sites or our offices. It's a great time for the church to be the church and I reckon a gift of COVID reminded us that we don't just go to church, we are supposed to be the church. And the fact that we couldn't gather reminded us that we have a mission right on our doorstep. So uh, as I finish, how could we help be a blessing to people in our neighbourhoods or our networks? There was some research done some years ago uh, of two groups that went to Thailand. One could be called the converters and one could be called the blessers. And the research tells us that those who went with the primary purpose of converting people saw very few come to faith in Jesus and had very little impact on the community. The people who went to bless, which God had something to say to Abraham, didn't he? I will bless you so that you will be a blessing. We started our gathering tonight talking about blessing. And throughout history, the people of God are meant to be those who bless. The, the blessers saw many more people come to faith in Jesus and their impact in the community was amazing. I don't know whether you've seen this idea of bless, but B stands for begin with prayer. Great prayer to pray at the start of a day is, Lord Jesus, I know that you've got some exciting things planned for today. Would you mind if I got involved with you in some of them? I'd love to. You're a gracious God, I'm a willing worker, and there's always going to be seeking souls. 
Could be in the shopping centre, could be in the neighbourhood, could be wherever I go. I had a call this afternoon with a lady who uh, some years ago, one of her sons died. I met this lady through the cricket club actually. Uh, took his own life basically. Uh, a drug overdose. And she rang today to say, my second son has also been found dead. Could you do the funeral for me again? I want to partner with Jesus in what he wants to do in those situations. And he's got some great plans for every day. Because Jesus said his father is always at work. And Jesus was constantly checking in to see what was on his father's agenda because he said, I don't do anything except what I see the father doing. So a great prayer at the start of a day is, Lord, I'd love to partner with you in your plans for today. L stands for listen. Listen to God, listen to the prompting. You know, when you get those names come to mind, I try and respond to those names, but there have been times when I haven't responded quickly enough and it's not been good. So listen to the Spirit's prompting and listen to others. It's been called the rarest form of love. E stands for eat. Eat with those who don't know Jesus. How, how long since you had a meal or a coffee with someone who doesn't know Jesus? I love the fact that people who didn't normally get invited to parties got invited to parties where Jesus was there and he transformed what happened. One of the things that uh, Julia and I seek to do and Jenny and I used to seek to do was to pastor our street and to, to throw the Christmas parties. And we're about to send out invitations for people to come to a, an afternoon tea. Are you the ones who welcome new people into your community and invite them to eat with you? Recently we met a Muslim family in our neighbourhood and invited them to come and have some time with us and they invited us to come to their place. Who knows, but God might have brought them into the situation for us to be partnering with him in their lives. S stands for serve. If you listen to people and you eat with people, you'll find out how you can serve people. And Jesus had something to say about serving, didn't he? I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. He washed dirty feet. Would we do the same? And the second S stands for share. Share your story in the way that Jesus' story has changed your story. I'd love to lead you in a prayer. Can we do that? Lord Jesus, please help us today like you helped others in the first century and every century and in every season since to seek you, to trust our lives to you and our needs to you. And please help us also to be channels of your love and grace and hope to others. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the same yesterday, today and forever. And you've got more game-changing to do. We would love to partner with you in that. But Lord, I especially pray tonight for any who are gathered here that would long to touch your clothes or to hear your word of encouragement or to see you at work in a game-changing way in their lives. May this be a community over these couple of days where it's okay to say, I've got a need. Would you pray with me and for me? We seek your help. In the name of Jesus. Amen.